I'm Ushma Neal with the Journal of Clinical Investigation, here today for another in our series of conversations with giants in medicine. In the United States alone, every year nearly two million people are diagnosed with cancer, and much of what we know about the genetics of cancer comes down to the work of the two legendary scientists that have joined me today, Drs. Bert Vogelstein and Ken Kinsler of the Ludwig Center at the Johns Hopkins Kimmel Cancer Center. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for those very kind uh, remarks and uh, compliments. <laughs> Do you think we could start by hearing a little bit about what you guys were like as little boys? Sure. Um, I, take a, I like to take things apart and sometimes put them back together, but unfortunately, uh, mostly take things apart. Um, very much liked reading about science and science fiction. Um, uh, enjoyed math. My father spent a lot of time teaching me math um, as a hobby and as a tool. And where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Northeast Philadelphia, Northeast Philly, um, in, a, uh, in row houses. They're now called townhouses, but when I was growing up they were called row houses. Um, How close to the jail were they? They were very close to the jail. <laughs> I worked in a, as a teenager, I worked in a deli and, uh, and we sold a lot of lottery tickets to people who worked at the jail. <laughs> and how about you, Bert? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Baltimore. I was born mm, about 100 feet up, <laughs> really, uh, when this place used to be obstetrics, obstetrics ward. Uh, of a hospital closely tied with, with Johns Hopkins. Uh, I liked it here when I was born, thought never saw any reason to leave, so I'm still here. Um, when I, I grew up in Baltimore, of course, um, I was interested, you know, usual kinds of things, athletics. Um, I, I love to read books. Uh, I didn't come from a scientific family. My uh, uh, father was uh, an attorney and, and my grandfather was a rabbi um, and uh, I hated school. Uh, uh, after a while I stopped going to school, started going to the library and reading instead and I, I got away with that for various involved reasons, <laughs> reasons for quite a bit of time until uh, I was uh, asked to leave school. Um, private school and went back to public school um, and uh, I had a big family, uh, three brothers and a sister are fairly close in age, uh, reasonably competitive. Uh, my father instilled a sense of competition into us um, uh, but we're still a very close family. Everyone still lives in Baltimore so uh, that's one of the one of the reasons I'm here, the main reason is because Johns Hopkins is the best place on earth. <laughs> Ringing endorsement. Yes. <laughs> now, when along this path then of just reading and reading and reading, did you start to get introduced to science and math? Um, well, when I was uh, even in grade school, I mean, the, the subjects I, I did best in were, were math, we didn't have any science in grade school, but that continued uh, throughout high school. I mean, I didn't have to struggle at all with science or math. Um, some of the other subjects were a struggle in the sense that I wasn't very interested, um, but, but I, loved, I loved the logic uh, that was involved uh, in science and particularly in mathematics. Um, at somewhere in my teenage years, uh, I saw a pamphlet that Hopkins had issued called, I think it was called The Making of a Physician. Uh, and uh, it made an impact on me. It, it made me interested, or, or let's say stimulated an interest in medical issues. Um, and that continued while I was in, in college. Um, I anticipated uh, always uh, doing some sort of research, probably medical research, and then it, it really crystallized the type of research that I wanted to do when I was a resident in pediatrics thereafter, which I can talk about if you'd like. Well, I think I would like to talk about that. 
but we were only ever at you tinkering with toys and doing math problems <laughs> with your father. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how that early interest and or aptitude for math and science led you to studying toxicology, am I right? Correct, yes. Um, so there's a couple things, you know, I, I sort of, it seemed to me that my father was an engineer, so he taught me about math and science, and, and engineering provided solutions to problems, and I sort of, I guess I made that extension that science would uh, provide solutions to problems, and in fact, one of the TV shows I really enjoyed when I was a child was Star, Star Trek, and of course Spock always solved something, you know, through some sort of scientific insight, and I, I guess that may have influ influenced me. Uh, so I was interested in, you know, how science might solve issues, and, and for some reason, I had an interest in cancer, and I, I, to this day, I don't know why I thought cancer was an interesting problem, um, but that actually sort of led me into the field of toxicology because it gave me exposure to that issue at the undergraduate level, and um, and why that would be. My parents were older than the typical parents. My father was 50 when I was born, but it's not like I knew a lot of people that were affected or you know they had been affected. So that's a bit of a mystery, but I do know why I chose toxicology because I could study, you know, human disease and cancer in the context of science at the undergraduate level. Okay. So then what led you to graduate school? Um, that's an interesting story because I, I was pretty, as an undergraduate, I was pretty clueless. So um, I, um, uh, you know, another thing that was attractive about the toxicology program is that you could have got a job doing science, and the program I was in is actually intended to do that um, as soon as you graduated. In fact, we did a internship in industry, um, and I did one of those things, and I came back, I, I actually stayed on a little long for my internship, I came back my senior year and I talked to the program director and said, you know, you can go to graduate school. And I said, what's graduate school? And you can get a PhD. I said, what's a PhD? He said, and I said, and they'll pay you to do that. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and then I, I learned uh, that, you know, I learned about the program. And I managed to take the GREs. I hadn't taken them. And I managed to apply to a few schools that deadlines hadn't passed. And fortunately, Hopkins uh, gave me a chance. So let's catch up in terms of the timeline. So you have gone to Penn for math, you decide you're also going to apply to medical school. So then what's medical school like? Because it sounds to me as though school kind of came very naturally to you in terms of the grades that you were able to get and getting through everything, whether or not you went to the classes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I never, uh, I guess, really had much trouble with grades. You know, it's kind of a talent, what you study kind of having some insight about what's likely to be asked uh, you know I, and I worked hard so um, it really wasn't the grades uh, it, it was really a question of formulating something that uh, I thought would make a difference um, that would be worthy of uh, spending my life on uh, I originally thought of going into math but um, uh, where, what convinced me, and I took some graduate courses in math, but what convinced me to go to medical school was two things. First of all, it wasn't clear to me that I was smart enough to go into math. Um, you know, I saw my professors, um, and uh, I saw how smart and insightful they were, and it wasn't clear to me that um, I had uh, the, that kind of insight and way of thinking to the degree that they did. Um, so that was one thing. And the second thing was uh, I thought that medicine or, or learning something about medicine, which I knew nothing about before I went to medical school. I hated biology in college. I thought that was incredibly boring. Um, but it, it seemed that that offered a route um, to, to help people uh, that might have been quicker than what uh, I could have accomplished uh, in, in mathematics. So for those two reasons, I decided to apply to medical school. And of course, I wanted to come to Hopkins, and I was fortunate enough to be accepted. So there's a sort of famous story that you're in your internship, and you encounter this family with a four-year-old daughter who you yes. diagnose with leukemia. Yes. 
How is it that that one problem was the one sort of girl and that medical problem that said, okay, I want to do research in cancer. How come it wasn't an autistic child that you met or someone with a neurodegenerative disease? Why cancer? Well, I, that's a good question. Uh, I think many decisions are life in life are experiential. It's not something you read, but something that, that makes a deep impact on you. You know, some people we've had in, uh, in our lab as trainees have had parents, brothers, sisters with cancer have even had cancer themselves. But in, in this case it was also uh, very personal. A little girl that presented uh, with leukemia, her, her father was a mathematician, taught at a local college, was essentially my age, maybe a couple of years older. And so I immediately identified with him, <laughs> immediately. Uh, you know, rapport, and you know, while we were going through the process of diagnosis, uh, he asked me, "Why did this happen to my precious little girl?" And uh, uh, right at that point, I realized uh, he was a professional. He wanted a serious answer, and I had no answer, um, and no one else in the world did either. And not only that, what he really wanted to know was, did I do anything, or did my wife and I do anything that caused my beautiful little girl to have this horrible condition? Uh, and, you know, he kind of asked me about that, obviously with some trepidation. And of course I told him the standard answer, you had nothing to do with it. But in reality, I didn't know. Maybe he spent too much time in the garage painting. You know, paint has benzene. Benzene is a known carcinogen. Uh, I couldn't really answer him definitively. Uh, and then also, you know, in thinking about that, um, it, it became obvious that 10 years from then, if another beautiful little girl gets leukemia, are, are we going to be in the same boat? Same parent, you know, different parents asking me the same question, not having any answer. And if you have no idea what causes the disease, how can you even conceive, imagine doing something about it? So, so right at that point of time, I, I guess it was a little bit of an epiphany. Uh, it seemed to me that, uh, you know, this. This would be a valuable thing to spend one's life on, trying to find out what's going on and hoping that that information could eventually uh, allow someone to look right in the eye of a parent and say, this is what caused your little girl's disease and in the distant future we know what caused it and we know how to get rid of it. So. After this epiphany, you decide, okay, I think I'm going to do some research. Uh, uh, I was able to enter NIH because of some research that I did at Hopkins during medical school. It wasn't primarily based on cancer, it was immunology. But I went to a lab that was a cancer lab. I uh, did, did some things there that resulted in publications. and. Um, uh, made the decision that what I wanted to do for the rest of my life was to continue that kind of work in cancer, not see patients anymore, because I didn't think it was possible to do both um, well. Uh, and then Hopkins uh, was generous enough to offer me a position, so that's when I, I started here. Okay. Did you know that you wanted to work with Bert Vogelstein? That is... Um and I did know I wanted to do cancer research. Um, and I had some idea that I wanted to do some genetics research, although when I first started with BIRD, I, we didn't, it wasn't necessarily, it was, it was a little bit of a while before we did the genetics. Um, I think that largely, you know, the tox, you know, the training in the toxicology, the 70s, you know, Love Canal, mutagens, AIM test, you know, you know, tobacco smoke, everything, you know, everything was talking about mutations and cancer and how they cause cancer. But 
you know, I, so I wanted to do cancer research. I picked a program that had an anti-cancer drug development program, and I was going to come to Baltimore for six years, get my PhD, and then go into industry. So I just delayed my original plan for four years. I, again, had no idea about <laughs> professors and academics and stuff like that. I didn't, that you actually did research in an academic setting. I was pretty naive at the time. But uh, despite that naivety, uh, the, fortunately, the, the pharmacology program here, and people gave me a chance. Okay. And then I got, then I was able to do my first rotation with Bert. Now, you know, just for the record, did yeah. you get in anywhere else except for Hopkins? Uh, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> Technically, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, and, the, and the reason for that, part of the reason for that, it was he went to this world-renowned school called the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy. Um, yeah, which was not obviously not well known in, in academia, but the people that interviewed it wasn't me. Yeah, I don't know yeah. what happened. I, you got to see what people said. I, I only know right. what people told me. So uh, well, they call in, in what they wrote. They said Ken was a jewel in the rough. So they recognized that you know, despite the fact that his academic credentials uh, were, were not. Uh, as impressive as someone coming from an Ivy League school, say. Um, he obviously got all A's and all that stuff, but uh, they recognized that uh, he was smart, and that's why they let him in. And I think that's the mark of a good leader, to be able to recognize, uh, recognize talent in people that ha don't have a fantastic record. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you just talk to them, uh, and you get to know them a little bit and something comes out. And uh, I don't know why you chose to do a rotation in my lab. It's, it's actually quite interesting. I was sitting in the director of the program's office and you called and said you needed a student. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little bit of serendipity here. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. I, but fortunately, I'm not sure I ever knew that. I don't know, but that uh, yeah, I was in Meta's lab, and you literally uh, called at that time. You were in the cancer center. Uh, you were doing some neat stuff, and uh, I, it didn't take long to realize that you know you were obviously a genius and a great person to work uh, work with. Uh, so. so this is 1983. 1983 in the yeah. fall of 83. Yes. And you never left. Uh, Why? I never left. I did a rotation. Because I wouldn't let him. I had to do a rotation <laughs> outside the laboratory, yeah. and um, you know, and I did, and then I came back, and um, we were always doing uh, new things, and and we and we could argue, and and it was I could learn a lot, and we could exchange thoughts, and 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 and. Uh, it was just always continued to be a learning environment, and to this day. Um, uh, and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we kid about not agreeing with each other, but if we both approached problems with the same exact approach or the same thoughts, and if we never disagreed, there would be no advantage for us to work together. So um, we like nothing more than to argue with the other person and find a, 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 a correct them or something like that, or, you know, win a debate. So what is it that Ken brings to the partnership that you didn't have on your own? Um, well, I immediately recognized Ken's talent as soon as he came to the lab and did his first experiment. And, and you know, I, I used to, well, I used to play a lot of tennis and teach tennis. And uh, a good tennis teacher can recognize someone who has extraordinary talent. Uh, you can recognize it within five minutes. Um, very few people have it. It's hard to describe, but you know it when you see it. Uh, so I knew immediately uh, Ken, Ken was brilliant. Uh, right then, I, you know, I thought hmm, he's probably smarter than me. And now after working with him for 30 years, I know that's not true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Uh, absolutely. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. It is true. Uh, and the way he's smarter than me is the following. Um, He's intuitive, you know. Maybe it's my background, but but I'm kind of bookish. Uh, so when when we're considering a new project or you know considering ways to do something, my my approach is to read all the literature for the last fifty years and, and try to 
integrate what's known and what's not known and come to some sort of decision about what's optimal to do. Ken just intuits it, intuits a decision, has incredible intuition, much better than mine, uh, about what's important. Uh, and he's unfortunately usually right, and I hate to say that on camera, <laughs> but it, but it's the truth. Uh, and um, so you know the, those two kinds of things: intuition um, uh, plus uh, searches of the literature, bring together uh, and make the decisions we jointly me uh, make uh, after you know, fist fighting, etc. Usually pretty reasonable. Uh, yeah, I think Bert's being a bit modest. When he says read the literature, he, he is the literature. He, he is like Google on, on legs. I mean, it's just amazing. And he couples that with an incredibly rigorous uh, logical and, and uh, thought process. Um, and, you know, and, you know I, I incredibly rigorous logic. And that really is, is really good. Uh, for the environment, good for our trainees, you know, and good for, you know, thinking things through and making sure that we, we um, you know, understand a problem in its entirety. Um, so could it's could you reason. interview us every day? Because <laughs> yeah. this is not what he usually says. <laughs> usually that's pretty straight, but you're, you're wrong. <laughs> It seems like you guys have a yin and a yang thing here that yeah. is part of the reason why you've been so synergistic over the last 30 years. So, you know, we're not here to necessarily enumerate all of the scientific discoveries, but they've been pretty legendary. You guys were the first to discover that P53 was a tumor suppressor. You found APC as the leading lesion for colorectal cancer. SAGE, digital PCR that presaged um, did liquid biopsies. I mean, it's kind of been an amazing series of dominoes that you've knocked down and opened fields. So how is it? Most people would be satisfied with just one of those discoveries over their scientific lifetime. Is it low-hanging fruit that you guys have a knack for finding? Is it hard work? How is it that you have managed this body of research? Well, let me start and then Ken will finish. Um, uh, in, in terms of, you know, is one thing enough? Um, uh, our end goal uh, is not really publishing papers, you know, and, and making discoveries that turn out to be important. Our end goal is really emptying the cancer center across the street in the hospital, right? So to us, these things are just kind of way stations to the end. So. You know, we, we don't really look at them with, with great source of satisfaction or pride. I mean, we're, we're glad, obviously, that we have been able to make them in, in combination with the multiple trainees that have done most of the work. But, you know, we, we both look at it as, as this is, we haven't reached what we set out to do. Far from it. So we're continually uh, trying uh, to do new things that get us closer to that goal and it w we basically start with kind of a zero based budget or research plan. Uh, fortunately we become uh, well funded. Um, we, we've never thought it necessary, to, for example, to do what we said we were going to do on an NIH grant. Uh, we believe the people at NIH administrators are very bright. They're scientists like us, and they'll be satisfied if we do something significant, whether or not it's what we initially intended to do. And now that we have a lot of uh, private uh, funding from HHMI and from uh, Ludwig and Lustgarten, those are major funders, uh, they, they actually expect us to do new things. Um, not to do sort of evolutionary research, to do revolutionary research that opens new fields. Uh, and we feel a huge obligation to, to the generous people that fund us. That's what we want to do. We want to set the world on fire. You know what, tomorrow I'm talking to incoming graduate students who have applied to one of the programs. Uh, and one of the things I always tell them 
is you're in graduate school because you want to set the world on fire. If you don't want to set the world on fire, then, you know, be a lawyer or, you know, something more mundane. And I, as a scientist, you have the opportunity to go where no woman has ever gone before, right? Uh, to, to really open up a new line of investigation, to set the world on fire. And, uh, I've heard you say before, you should think like a science fiction writer. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason for that is if you ask scientists to predict the future, they're horrible at it. Because they're so tied to data and reality. And if you ask science fiction writers to predict the future, they do it. The good ones, you know? Uh, and they think uh, of things that aren't possible now, but they're not limited by what we can do now. But, yeah, I mean, they have the view, the dream, and it's up to the scientists. We can have those views, too, but in addition, we can actually execute those views and make them into reality. So what a fantastic opportunity for people, for young scientists, you know, to set the world on fire, to do things that no one has done before. Uh, Ken and I just both feel so incredibly lucky that we're able to do this and that we call this work. <laughs> I mean, this is hardly work. Right. I mean, this is just fantastic fun and, uh, and a great opportunity. So he said you would finish the answer. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I was reflecting. I mean, one of the, you know, talk about it being a wonderful job. We, we all sometimes take for granted that we get to work with incredibly intelligent and competent people. Uh, and we are just very fortunate. The trainees that we get to work are, are you know, you know, really brilliant. I mean, they, they, you know, they got into the best medical and graduate programs in the country. And you know, I, I think Bert hit upon some of the reasons of our success. You know, we try to rethink and ask how we can have a major impact. Um, but also, you know, in the idea of giving practical advice to people, Bert, Bert by example and in his words has been a, a great leader. And one of the things that you, you know, the advice you gave me and other trainees when we were young is like, you know, you, you can never have enough credit or money, so don't pursue those as goals. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, you know, you ask why one discovery after another, it's partly the approach, part of the zero thing. But the other thing is often success can interfere with future success because you get invitations to go to meetings, you get invitations to be department chairmen, and they're all good things, but they, they, they tend to remove you from the laboratory and it makes you harder to participate in future discoveries. So Bert has always set the example and the focus of being there in the laboratory. He's, he's like hardly ever not there. I don't think he's gone to more than a half a dozen meetings in 30 years. Um, and, uh, you know, that allowed us to focus on the science. I read that you have said before, you need humor in the lab given how many mistakes and how many failures you encounter. So your lab famously makes people wear crowns and tell jokes at your lab meetings. So do you have any jokes that you can share? PG rated uh, or PG-13 rated I jokes? Just, I just read this. made a lab meeting yesterday. I, had an unexpected, I did an unexpected lab meeting uh, last Thursday. And, uh, and it was last minute cancella cancellation. And then I got up there and I was going to present something. And uh, they called me on the joke. So, uh, so this is the joke I used. I said, uh, mm -hmm. two electrons are, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I've got to cut that out. So this is a joke I use. Two atoms are walking down the street, and one atom says to the other atom, uh, I think I lost an electron. And the other atom says, are you sure? And he goes, yeah, I'm positive. <laughs> so. Do you have any favorites? Well, I have a favorite, but it's a little longer than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've got time. It's not better. It's right. longer. Yeah. <laughs> my, one of my favorites... <laughs> This actually happened to me about a year ago. I was going to visit my grandchildren uh, who live in Bethesda, and um, on the way I saw this sign that said, Talking Dog for Sale. So this obviously caught my attention. Uh, I stopped at the house, went in, uh, and the guy uh, who was in the living room says, Oh, yeah, he's in the back. Go look at him. So, uh, I went in the back, and there's this dog that doesn't look special. But I said, are you the dog that supposedly talks? And he says, yes, I am. <laughs> and I said, well, tell me your story. And he says, well, 
when I was a puppy, people found out I could talk uh, and, and understand things, so they recruited me into the CIA. And I went all over the world, served in uh, missions everywhere, uh, and I would go into various places and listen to the conversations, and no one would suspect for a minute that I could relay that uh, information uh, to the CIA, CIA, which I did. Uh, and then after I, I retired from there, I, I came back to the U.S. and did some work for, for airports, etc. Then uh, I met a wonderful uh, uh, another dog, and we got married, had children, and, and uh, now I'm retired, and that's my story. So I go back into the house and, and say, uh, well, how much do you want for that dog? And he says, ten dollars. And I say, ten dollars? The dog is amazing. Do you know all the stuff he did in his life? And the guy says, Ah, that dog's a liar. He never did any of that. Um, and <laughs> the reason I like that story is because it gets at the fundamental question of what's true and what's really important. <laughs> uh, and that's something that I think Ken and I try to instill in our trainees is a sense for what's real, whether it's mm -hmm. published or not, but even more importantly, what are the gems inside it, even if it's not perfect. So. Excellent. Can you recall your first experiment, even as a child? Yeah, it depends on what you, what you classify as an experiment. So, I mean, I used to like to tinker, put things together, so, and take things apart. So I wanted to clearly sticks in my mind is when I tried to ply, ply, pry, pry out an electrical receptacle for, plug from the wall with a knife and, and, and shot <laughs> myself. And I used to do a lot of things with model trains and some of it was 120 and I used to go connect this to that. And I've shocked myself many a times on that. So, you know, as, as a, as you know, in the young days, you know, pre-teen, I used to just electrocute myself a lot. Uh, and then the, probably the closest thing, when I was undergrad, I had a work-study program um, that allowed me to tinker w in the physics lab with a physics professor. And I, I wound up, it's not real science, but I wound up building an, an MR that could distinguish the peaks out of scraps. They could distinguish the peaks of ethanol. Now, obviously, people could do that with an instrument like a thousand times better, but it was sort of cool to be able to cobble things together. Yeah, and you asked before about what the differences uh, between uh, Ken and me are, and that's one of them. I mean, he can build those instruments. I, I have no idea what to do when instruments break down other than take them into Ken's office. Uh, you know, and he's really uh, incredible with that kind of thing. People, some, we do obviously a lot of genomic sequencing, uh, genome-wide, all that stuff, and sometimes people ask us, well, you know, do you have a large bioinformatics department in our lab? And, and I say, yeah, incredibly large, and point to him because he's it. <laughs> Develops all the computer programs, all the bioinformatics, uh, you know, single-handedly. And um, uh, it's pretty impressive. Let's say you could not have been a scientist. What else do you think you could have done or dedicated yourself to? Jeez. Um, what would I ha have been? What could I have chosen? Um, you know, the only alternative career I ever really thought of was a garbage collector. And the reason I like that is because you get up early and you finish collecting the garbage and then you come back and can spend the rest of the day with your family. Now. Uh, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have chosen that as an alternative, but if you ask the question, that's the only other alternative other than medicine, you know, practicing some sort of spe speciality in pediatrics I've ever really considered. How about you, Ken? Well, engineering might be too close to science, electrical engineering, programming. Probably would have, maybe would have done something like that. I like building things. I like making new things, so something along Carpenter? those lines. Carpenter? I do do carpentry on the side. Mm. I like doing that. I've built many of things. Uh, finished a basement or two. 
Well, listen, thank you both so much for joining me. This was really a lot of fun, and I can absolutely tell why you two, why you two get along so well. Well, fun for us, too. Thanks for doing it. All right. Thank you.